As you remember, last time we spoke about the Alexandrian school, today the Antiochian school of thought, which is, it deals mainly with biblical text, which is to be interpreted. This is how they deal with the, uh, with the, the Bible. They say, the text is to be interpreted according to the plain meaning conveyed by its grammatical construction and its historical and historical events. So they look at the text, they read it, they look at the wording, the grammar, and the historical background of the events that that text is speaking about, and at the same time, the construction, which is through that text, they convey the meaning, they understand the meaning of that verse, which last time we spoke about the Alexandrian school, they just go behind, uh, behind all this textual and grammatical construction and historical events. I don't want to dwell on that because that we have only one hour and I was looking at what we have here to do in, in another two sessions, which is three hours. It's not an easy task. Trust me, it's not an easy task. It's a difficult one, but I'm trying to be as um, practical and brief as possible. Antioch rivaled Alexandria in its catechetical school, and it became an important center for philosophical debate and Christian learning. It provided the Antiochian church with a succession of famous churchmen and theologians who imprinted their names in the history of the early Christian church, their writings and exegesis of the Old and New Testament. Individuals like Ignatius, a distinct and great defender of the true faith against early heresies within the church, emphasizes on the virgin birth and the human nature of Christ, which created a special characteristics of the Antiochian school theology. In his letter, Ignatius, let's, let's read what he says. In his letter, we see underlined theology on the human nature of Christ and his suffering in flesh. This is particularly emphasized in his letter to Smyrnaeans. He says, he was truly of the seed of David according to the flesh, and the Son of God, according to the will and power of God, that he was truly born of a virgin, was baptized by John, in order that all righteousness might be fulfilled in him, and was truly under Pontius, Pilate, and Herod, the Tetrarch, nailed, to the cross for us in his flesh. Of this fruit we are by his divinity, uh, divinely blessed passion that he might set up a standard for all ages. Through his resurrection to all, his holy and faithful followers, whether among Jews or Gentiles, in the one body of his church. The emphasis of Ignatius on the human nature of Christ led the rise of many theologians who followed his footsteps and gradually developed a unique Christology that became the focus of attention and an exclusive characteristics of the Antiochian church. Other notable teachers of the Antiochian church were Malchian, Diodor, John Chrysostom, and Theodore of Mepsostia. By the way, Theodore was condemned almost 100 and some years after his death. 
was condemned, which is, shows how Christianity sometimes do make mistakes, the church. It was in Antioch where the teaching of two hypostases developed and later led to the debate, two natures, huh? And later led to the debate and controversy of the natures of Christ between Theodorat, which was a defender of the two natures uh, theology, Christology. He was born in 393, passed away 458 AD between Theodoret and Cyril of Alexandria, the patriarch of the known patriarch of the Coptic Church in 375 to 444 AD. Theodore of Mopsustia was born in 350. I have to touch on Theodore because he is the teacher of Nestorius. Theodore of Mopsustia was born in 350 AD in Antioch of noble parent, Sozomen, in his church history say, says that Theodore was well conversant with the sacred books and with the rest of the dis discipline and re and philosophy. Theodore was a friend of John Chrysostom. Have you heard of John Chrysostom? He's a famous uh, theologian and was greatly influenced by him and his friend Maximus, who was later the bishop of Isornians in Seleucia. He was a regular attendant of Libanus, lecturer of, at Antioch, and later attended the monastic school of Diodor, who became the bishop of Tarsus in 37 AD. Theodore himself was made bishop of Mepsostia in 392. During his lifetime, Theodore was highly respected. The church respected Theodore. They used to call him the greatest theologian, the greatest interpreter. He was considered a great exegesist and theologian of the church worldwide. He was known for his defense of orthodoxy against the Apollonarians, Anomnians and the Arians. Surprisingly, after his death, he was condemned, and most of his writing were considered heretical. I would ask you to look for the books of Theodore of Mopsostia and read them, and you will be surprised of uh, his theology and exegetical writings. I mean, he's phenomenal. The writing of Theodore may clearly lift, reflect the Antiochian theology and Christology of his age. His views on the incarnation and the two natures in Christ. Remember, he used to speak about the two natures before the condemnation, and they read all his books. But when the controversy of Nestorian controversy and with the Alexandrians, they, because he was, uh, Nestorius was on his side, so they automatically condemned him too. He views, his views on incarnation and the two natures in Christ can be established in his letters and exegesis as well, uh, we see in many of his writings. I have some quotations here, but they are too long, which I'm not going to read them, but uh, regarding the term mother of God, listen carefully what he says about the term mother of God. Is Mary a man's mother or God's mother? And then, who was crucified? He's asking, he's asking the reader this question, these questions. Is Mary a man's mother? or God's mother? And then, who was crucified? God or a man? But the solution for these puzzles is clear. We must say both. The one by the nature of the things, the other 
in virtue of a relation. Mary was a man's mother by nature, which is true. You know, Christ was born of Mary. Since what was in her womb was a man. Some will read this and say, oh, he's denying the divinity of Christ, but wait. Wait and see what he's going to say. Just as it was also a man who came forth from her womb. But she is God's mother. Since God was in the man who was fashioned, not circumscribed in him by nature, but existing in him according to the disposition of his will. Very clear, beautiful interpretation. Therefore, he says, it is right to say both. Mother of God, mother of man. Mother of God, mother of Christ. Both. And each in an appropriate sense. What is the meaning in appropriate sense? It means she's a mother of man because of his human nature. But mother of God because of the God who was in that man that we called God. But you should not give beginning to the divine nature of Christ in the, from Mary because Mary is just uh, a human. And the same answer, answer must be given if they ask, was God crucified? Or a man? That is to say, one must answer. Both. Indeed, but not in the same sense. The one who was crucified was a man, but was God. But the death, the pain, the suffering was received in the flesh which was received from Mary, not in the divine itself, because the divine nature cannot suffer, cannot die, cannot have pain. This statement is very interesting for our study of the Nestorian controversy, as it sets the scene of why Nestorius rejected the term Theotokos. The term Theotokos, God-bearer. And shows the extent of how much his teaching was influenced by Theodore. Nestorius was very much influenced by what I read to you now from Theodore. It also reflects reflect on certain elements of the Assyrian Church of the East teachings regarding the question of the Incarnation suffering of God and the term Theotokos. You will not hear in the prayers of the Assyrian church or any of the hymns that we say God died or God suffered. That does not mean that we do not believe that Christ is God. Christ is fully divine, fully human. He is God. But we are very hesitant in giving the divinity the term death. We keep the, div the divinity, the divine nature, from the terms of death and suffering. That's why we say we do not use the term God suffered or God died. But again, that does not mean that we, when we hear it, other churches saying in their prayers, that does not mean we say, oh, heretics. No, we don't say that. But it's in our tradition. It's in our teaching. We never use these terminologies of God died, God suffered. But we understand what do they mean by the term God died. It means Christ, the man, died. 
who was God. Many writings and exegeses of the early fathers of the Antiochian church were studied and later taught at the famous school of Edessa. Edessa was a famous school of the Church of the East, and Nisibis, which we call it Nisibin. The Antiochian fathers such as Ignatius, Diodor, Theodore of Mipsostia, John Chrysostom, and Nostorus are considered saints in our church. Within this background in Alexandria and Antioch, we will go over the events that led to the Nestorian controversy. We will also look into some of the writing of the early fathers of the Assyrian Church of the East in comparison to a short summary of Cyril's 12 chapters, which is the, the chapters of condemnation of Nestorus issued by uh, Cyril, Patriarch of Alexandria, based on surviving Syriac and Arabic texts preserved in a number of manuscript. Now, who is Cyril of Alexandria? Bishop and doctor of the Alexandrian church, born in Alexandria in 378 AD. He is the nephew of famous Theophilus, the Patriarch of Alexandria in 385 to 412 AD. In 403, Cyril was ordained Electa, was a, and then Electa of the church in Alexandria when Theophilus died, Cyril, after some opposition, was elected and consecrated as his successor on 18th October 412. He did not have a good relationship with Orestes, the Byzantine, Byzantine governor of Egypt. Let's leave that uh, controversy on, on one side because that's another subject. No doubt Cyril, by the way, is a great theologian. That's no doubt about it. His work can be considered some of the greatest contribution to the development of Christian theology worldwide. Let's read what he says about the unity of Christ in his, in his book, just briefly. From his letter to Nestorus, he wrote a letter to Nestorus the Patriarch. His, ex his explanation of the unity of the logos, the word, in his hypostasis natures with the human body in Jesus, he says, we do not say that the Logos became flesh by having his nature changed, which we agree to that too, nor for that matter that he was transformed into a complete human being composed out of soul and body. We agree with that too. On the contrary, we say that in an unspeakable and comprehensible way, the Logos united to himself in his hypostasis in nature, flesh enlivened by a rational soul, and in this way became a human being and has been des designated son of man. We agree to that too. That's very true. The Logos came and united himself with, with the human the nature that he took from Mary, virgin, and he became, uh, uh, we, know, him, we, we uh, know him as son of man. He did not become a human being simply by an act of will or good pleasure, any more than he did so by merely taking on a person. So the logo took a person. I don't want to read this, it's too long, but when I read it and I put that text in, in my um, uh, thesis, 
when I read it, I said, this is exactly what the Church of the East teaches. There's nothing, nothing new, you know. But let's go to Nestorius briefly. Nestorius of Constantinople. Nestorius was born in 386 of Persian parents in the city of Germanica, Syria. He studied in Antioch and later joined the monastery of Eupripius near Antioch. He was famous for his eloquence and renowned for his motivational preaching. When he used to preach in the cathedral in, in Constantinople, used to be interrupted by praises and claps from, from people because he, was, he used to defend Christianity against uh, you know, non-Christians non and uh, other sects of... Uh, uh, then, in fact, his fame went beyond Antioch. Therefore, he was summoned by Emperor Theodosius II to fill the vacancy of Constantinople, the capital of the Roman Empire, in 428 AD. On the day, listen to this, listen how, what kind of person he was. On the day of his appointment and consecration on 10th of April, 428, Nestorius gave his famous sermon addressing the emperor. The emperor was sitting in the altar area, uh, which is a custom. So they consecrated Nestorius, and this is part of his sermon. Give me my prince, the earth purge of heretics. He was totally against the heretics. He said, give me my prince, the earth purge of heretic, and I will give you a heaven as a recompense. Assist me in destroying heretics, and I will assist you in vanquishing the Persians because your Roman Empire and the Persian Empire were at war. Nestorius was a fervent leader in, fight, uh, leader in fighting heretics. His attack on the Arians culminated by ordering to close their churches in Antioch. The churches, their churches were set on fire, which caused the neighboring property to burn down too. He continued his attack against other movements such as the Apollinarians, Novatians, and others, and Macedonians. It was expected that after starting such a harsh campaign, harsh, harsh campaign against so many groups, what do you expect? Nestorius would have certainly created many enemies for himself because he kept fighting all these heretics, the Aryans and this and that. By the way, even the Egyptian church were fighting these, so they both met at the same, in the same uh, fight against heretics. His Christology and theology was mainly based on what he inherited from his mentors, Diodore of Tarsus and Theodore of Mepsustia, the one I just read from Theodore to you. Exactly that's what he taught especially the Christology of the two natures in Christ. We read the following from his reply to Cyril. After that letter he received from Cyril, he replies. Second letter of June 40, 430, about the two natures of Christ. They say, therefore, I believe also in our Lord Jesus Christ, his Son, the only begotten. Notice how, having first laid down as foundations the titles common to the Godhead and manhood. See, he, he gave the titles to Christ as the divine at the same time as fully human. Lord and Jesus, and Christ, and only begotten, and Son. They then build thereon the tradition of the enmanment and the resurrection 
and the pa passion in order that with those titles which alike designate either nature placed first. It means when I mention the, these titles to you, each title designate the nature, the divine nature and the human nature. I'm not creating something out of this. It is just there. The properties of the sonship and the lordship might not be served, nor those of the natures risk disappearing in confusion in the singularity of the sonship. Paul has been their tutor in this. For when he is referring to the divine amendment and intent to go on to the passion, he first mentioned Christ, the common title, as I said just now, of the natures, and then goes on to the word appropriate for each of the natures. So by this we learn that he was, Nestorius was teaching two natures, a divine nature, a fully divine nature, and a human nature. Nothing new. There's nothing new about this. Because the church adopted this from Theodore, and it was taught in Antioch. There was no problem with that. But what happened? Why don't we go into the controversy? Let's see how it started. On 26 November, 428 AD, a month from now, the sermon of Anastasius, the chaplain of the Nestorius, of Nestorius, you know, each bishop or archbishop has got a chaplain. Achnan, we say archdeacon. So this was a chaplain for the patriarch, Nestorius, the patriarch. He's preaching in the church. Listen what he said. Out of nowhere. Let no man call Mary Theotokos. Oops. And people are sitting, listening to him. You know, some will go like this and some will go, oh no, what is this? Because there was two, thought, two thoughts of uh, uh, understanding, even in Antioch. For Mary was but a woman. And it is impossible that God should be born of a woman. This statement shows that the term Theotokos must have been circulated in Antioch and other Christian centers, as we have stated earlier. It was Oregon who first, in 230, used the term Mother of God. The first person who used this term was Oregon. Now, let's go back to what he said. God... It is impossible that God should be born of a woman. Now I ask you this. Listen, a chaplain, an archdeacon, what do you think? Do you think that he, he meant that by this, that Christ is not God because therefore we cannot say, it's impossible to say God is born from a woman? Or, maybe he was referring that the divine nature of Christ cannot be born of a woman, which is true. No church in face of this earth, on face of this earth, no church, whether Orthodox, Catholic, Evangelical, whatever, keep out the Mormons, keep out the Jehovah's Witnesses but I'm talking about apostolic churches. We'll say that. We'll say that the divine nature of Christ was born of Mary because this is heresy. Therefore, Anastasius must have been responding to a common ongoing dispute that already existed among the church community in Constantinople. 
he was criticized for his sermon on Theotokos, definitely, because some people could not understand. Some people, they said, why? Listen, we always used to call Mary Theotokos. Now you're, this is heresy. Turmoil exploded within the people, which compelled Nestorus. Now the patriarch will come to calm things down, right? That's what you expect because he's, that was his, his chaplain. Nestorus, as the head of the church, to interfere and come to the aid of his chaplain by supporting his statement regarding the title Theotokos. The situation further escalated with a second incident, which occurred during the festival of the Virgin Mary in 429 AD, 9 AD. While in Constantinople, the sermon of Proclus, Bishop of Cyzicus, or Cyzicus, defended the title of Theotokos. <laughs> now listen, another guy came, another bishop came from somewhere, He's, uh, he's visiting Constantinople, and he's preaching. Guess what he says? He defends Theotokos, in, obviously, against what the chaplain said. The situation escalated and, uh, and backed his claim by many references from the Bible, this bishop. Socrates, a historian, church historian, who is known for his strong opposition of Nestorius, claims that Nestorius replied to Proclus by stating this. He claims, this is a claim. He, this is Nestorius saying, he who says simply that God is born of Mary makes the Christian dogma ridiculous to the heathen, for the heathen will reply, I cannot worship a God who is born, died, and is buried. When you read this, immediately you will say, Nestorius is de de denying the divinity of Christ. But later, Nestorius will say, listen, I never said this. Nestorius responded to the argument in one of his sermons, preferring to avoid the term Theotokos. He never used the term Theotokos. He says, the form that received God, let us honor as God. What is the form? It is a person who was born of Mary, let us honor him and revere him as God. Together with God. God the Word, God the Father. I say who received God. Not who gave birth to God. For there is only one God. The Father to whom his compound word... Theotokos applied. He says, Theotokos should be only used to the father who bore, who? Christ, his son. Because he said, this is my son. Right? When he was baptized, we heard his voice saying, this is my beloved son. So he is Theotokos. He's the bearer of that God. Now, it could sound a bit odd, but listen, let's, let's continue. Nestorus then tried to find a compromise between the two parties. He called them, he said, listen, forget about Theotokos, forget about this. Why don't we agree, both we agree, and call Mary Theodokos in Greek, which means God receiver. She received God, but not the bearer of God. 
Do you think we'll agree? they will agree to this? Already Nestor has got thousands of enemies back there. They are trying to find a way to get rid of him. No one listened to this. We will see later how Nasuris tried to qualify his use of the term. He gives enough reasons for his refusal to use the term Theotokos. However, his opponent accused him of denying the divinity of Christ until this moment. Until this moment, some will say that Nasuris denied the divinity of Christ, which is not true. You know, there is two Nestorianism in the world, a true Nestorianism and the classical Nestorianism, Nestorianism. The classical Nestorianism, we hear it from other people who spoke about Nestorus. But the true Nestorianism, we hear it from him in his book. The only book survived, by the way, Bizarre of Heliclitus. They burned all his writing. They burned all his books. The only book left survived was one which he's written in Sinai, was called the Bazaar of Heraclitus. This is an accusation Nasturis continue to deny, especially in his book, Bazaar of Heraclitus. In this book, he argues that he never did so. He never divine, he never denied the divinity of Christ. And that in fact, his intention was to try safeguarding the humanity and divinity of, Christ, of Jesus Christ. Listen what he says. Mary did not give birth to Godhead. That's true. Who can, which Christian can say, no, he's wrong? Godhead says, Mary did not give birth to Godhead, but she gave birth to a man. The inseparable instrument of the divinity. But he, now he's referring to Cyril, by a change of the word divinity, made me say, now he's accusing Cyril that he's putting words in my mouth. He says, he, by a change of the word divinity, made me say, my good sirs, Mary did not give birth to God. But there is surely a great difference between saying God and saying Godhead. See what happened? See how Christians, even then, they used to change wording. One word you change, the whole thing will collapse. Nostorius was talking about the Godhead, the divine. He never mentioned the word Christ. L listen, let me read this. It's very important. He says, Mary did not give birth to Godhead, but she gave birth to a man, the inseparable instrument of the divinity, which the divine nature was united to the human nature in Christ himself. But he, Cyril, by a change of the word divinity, the one he mentioned, he said, made me say, as if it made people to listen to me as if I'm saying this. My good sirs, Mary did not give birth to God. But there is surely a great difference between saying God and saying Godhead. For the latter word means the divine and incorporeal substance, not flesh at all, for flesh is complete is composite and created. Whereas God is a term that can properly be used also of the temple of divinity, which by its union with the divine substance of God, 
receives dignity, but is not changed into the divine substance. It means that human nature was not changed into a divine nature. But there is a unity between the divine nature and the human nature in Christ. For the see of Alexandria to deny the title Theotokos by Nestorus is an attempt to shift from the purity of faith. You know, you don't blame them. This is how they believe. They used to use the term Theotokos because of their saints used it. Since the term, as mentioned before, was used by Oregon and accepted by the church and, and Alexandria. For Cyril, he considered it his responsibility to defend the dogma and prove that Antioch, in the person of her bishop, has departed from the true faith. The fighting, the jealousy between the two seas, the Alexandrian Sea and the Constantin or the Antiochian Sea. The opponent of Nestorus found in Cyril an, an ally to defeat him and prevent the sea of ancient Antioch from failing into a new heresy. Therefore, on Easter Day 429, Cyril gave his famous sermon on the matter without mentioning the name of Nestorus. On Easter Day, not the Godhead in itself, but the Logos which was united with the human nature was born of Mary. We agree to that. We, the Church of the East, we agree to that. That's very true. Not the Godhead itself, but the Logos which was united, the Word, huh? which was united with the human nature was born of Mary. Even Nestorus accepts that. Hence, the controversy grew rapidly and involved the interference of, of emperor himself. And later, the pope interfered. And the pope sends a letter to Nestorus. I give you only 10 days that you come back from this, what you said, and you otherwise you will be defrocked. You'll be, I mean, it just got messy. Some historical events are questionable, and the real interpretation of the thoughts expressed by both Cyril and Nestorus are disputed and may sometimes be misrepresented. For example, it is commonly believed that it was Nestorus who said to Theodorus, listen to this, this is very important. There was some guy visiting Nestorus, in the conversation, he was a bishop, by the way, this, this person. In the conversation, this bishop of Ankara in Galatia, during a discussion between the two, Nestorus and him, he says, it means Nestorus says, I cannot term him God, who was two and three months old. Now, this bishop is quoting Nostorus to others. I cannot call, term him God to Christ, who was two or three months old. I am therefore clear of, of your blood, and shall in future come no more among you, Nostorus says. But in Sozomen, who surprisingly state that Nestorus accepted the term Theotokos, saying, now one of, one of the historians who was against Nestorus, I mean, to the core, he was honest to say, listen, Nestorus did not reject the term Theotokos, mother of God, saying, Nestorus saw that the Contention which had been raised was thus tending to destruction of communion. In bitter regret, he called Mary Theotokos and cried out, 
Let Mary be called Theotokos, if you will, and let all disputes cease. He says, enough, go call her Theotokos. Enough of all this dispute. But although he made this recantation, no notice was taken of it. No one listened to it. You know why? Because they wanted to get rid of him. For his disposition was not revoked. And he was banished to the oasis where he still remains. When he wrote this Suzuman, Nostorus was alive in Sinai Desert. See what happened? They went and gathered all synods and condemned Nostorus to exile. Where? To Sinai. On the other hand, we read the following of Nostorus. Now let's see what he says about this three months, two months old baby I cannot call God. Let's see whether, did he really say that? By the way, all the teachings of Nestorus are kept in the Church of the East. We never heard this. <laughs> we, never, we never ever read this term, that one day Nestorus says that I cannot call God, call him God who is two, three years old, three months old. Now, but listen to what he says in the Bazaar of Heraclitus. They did not, as judges, examine this evidence. That it is not right to say that God sucked milk or born of a virgin. And he was likewise said, I do not say that God is two or three months old. And he, Cyril, received this statement without examination, without even calling me, huh? Too bad they didn't have emails at that time. Because if you send a letter, it will take six months for it to reach the, the other part of the world. When he, Cyril, receives this, he took it as truth. But he said, they never examined this. Without asking witness any questions, such as, of what was he speaking to you when he spoke thus. It means ask this bishop when he said this. Have you asked him, why did he say this word? What he was talking about? Then all Theodotus, now Nestorus, is talking to that bishop who went and claimed these words to the other parties. He said, Oh, Theodotus, you were accurately informed as to his meaning. When you questioned him and he answered you that he did not say that God is two or three months old. That him, he said, when you spoke to Nestorus, I did not say that he was three months old. Was it as though he did not say that Christ is God for he was two or three months old was. It is in this sense that he said it to you. Was it in this sense he said it to you? You then, did you say that God was born of a woman and was two or three months old in the sense that his own usia, which is a term, kiana, nature was changed into the nature of a man and that in sense he was begotten and became two or three months old? Are both from the one God the word or was he of a distinct and unlike usia or nature and begotten in both of them? The letter goes, it's a long letter, but it's very interesting to hear it from the mouth of Nestorus after he was condemned, saying that all these words are not true. They are false. Clearly, Nestorus was explaining, explana, explaining and advocating the Christology of two natures, 
in Christ while maintaining the Antiochian interpretation of the mystery of the Incarnation. He insisted on shielding the divine nature from any human attributes. That was his aim. Shield the divine nature from any pain and suffering that the nature, the human nature is receiving. Shield it. Shield it. In a series of letters and responses, Cyril continues to debate the issue with Nestorus and demanded that he be put to trial in a synod. This position was made more effective, as I said, when Pope was interfered. Listen to this, to the letter of Pope. Take heed, be careful, take heed that unless you teach about Jesus Christ our God, what the Roman Alexandrian and Universal Catholic Church holds and what up to your time was held by the Holy Church of Constantinople, and if within 10 days after receiving of this, you do not openly and in writing condemn this impious novelty, which tend to undo what the ancient scripture, script, scripture joins, you are excluded from the communion of the whole Catholic Church. But guess what? Then the Catholic and the Alexandrian <laughs> separated too. They started fighting each other. Finally, in a synod held by Cyril, we are ending here, In 430, 12 anathemas were issued against Nestorus and were delivered to him on 7 December 430 AD by a commission sent from Alexandria to Constantinople. Nestorus, he issued 12 anathemas against Cyril in response. I read these anathemas, both. The only issue involved is the issue of Theotokos and the unity of the two nature in one united because the, the Coptic church, they believe in one nature. The other churches believe, including us, the Catholic, the all other Orthodox churches, most of them, they believe in two natures. But we, I have to be fair to say, when the Egyptian church say one nature, that does not mean, that does not mean they deny the, the divine nature or the human nature. But they say they are united. They both, both uh, uh, the divine nature and the human nature united in one person of Jesus Christ, one uh, kiana, one nature. No mixture. No confusion, just like when you say, when I'm saying no mixture, just imagine you take, you take uh, ink and water. When you put ink in a water, it'll become one color. It means they are mixed, that's it, correct? But when you put oil and water, they are separated. There is a thin line of separation of water. And this is how we believe in Two natures, united, but there is a separation. One does not affect the other. I'm not going to read all the 12 anathemas because they are too long. But let's, because we took five minutes prayer, can you give me five minutes? Is it okay? Ten? That's very generous of you. It is important to note that the Arabic translation manuscript published by the Mengana, which is a, a Christian Arabic text discovered by this gentleman Mengana, um, 
has used the word qnuma in Arabic for the Greek word hypostasis. The Syriac word for nature is kiana. The importance of a deeper analysis as well as a comparison between the English, Greek, Arabic, and Syriac translation of Cyril's teachings with that of the Church of the East Father will give us an idea of how much the language barrier and misinterpretation of some important words played a huge part in widening the gap between the Church of the East and her sister churches in the West. In addition, it will help us to understand the true meaning of Cyril's anathemas in contrast with the Church of the East Christology. Furthermore, it is important to note that most of Cyril's teaching is not rejected by the Church of the East. This is important for the Egyptian to hear it, for the Coptic Church to hear it. The Church of the East does not reject most of the teachings of the Coptic Church. Does not. It's just we don't use Theotokos. And we believe in two natures. The divine nature, separate, the divine nature and the, the human nature, united in one person. And each nature has its characteristics, the underlying characteristics that we call qnume, which I'll come to that later, to the word qnuma ruined everything. I wish if the Assyrian church did not use the term qnuma. I wish personally because it's confused everything, because it's a very Aramaic word, Hebrew word, whatever you call it. They couldn't understand it. The West interpreted the word Qnuma as person. That's why they say, you Nestorians, you Assyrians, you believe in two persons, two Christ, Christ divine and Christ uh, human, two persons, which is not true. This is heresy. We call it heresy. As seen earlier, and from the reply of Nasurus with his own 12 counter anathemas against Cyril, it is clear that he was heavily influenced by the Christology of Diodor and Theodore of Mepsostia, the two natures in Christ. Now, Finally, which is next week, I'm going to conclude, which I will give a long interpretation of the word qnuma, the one which caused all this trouble within the church of the East and the Coptic church. And finally, you will see that, ah, oh, crazy. Couldn't you guys, couldn't you guys sit together and explain to each other what you meant and what you, for instance, as we did with the Catholic Church regarding the word Theotokos, which I'll come to that in the Christological Declaration we signed with the Vatican in 1994. You will see that we, we sit like brothers and we solved the problem 1,400 years of division. It is known fact that Nestorus was not the patriarch of the Church of the East, never been a patriarch of the Church of the East, or the See of Seleucia Ctesiphon, our patriarchal see. During the controversy in the West, Mardadishu was our patriarch. We had our own patriarch. Nestorus wasn't our own patriarch. I'm talking about 421 to 456 AD, Mardadishu was the patriarch of the Church of the East, residing in Seleucia Ctesiphon, Iraq, Baghdad. The Church of the East theology was mainly based on the Nicene teaching and, clear, and early fathers of the Church interpretations. Surprisingly, we learn from the Synod of Marischak in 410 AD that it was at that Synod the Church had officially adopted the Nicene Creed, the one, it's in the book you see here, 410, which the meeting was of 420, 325. 
and adhered to the universal teaching and canons of the Nicene Synod. At the fall of Nisibis in a, on the hands of the Persian in 363 AD, the famous Saint Ephraim the Syriac, accompanied by many teachers, left Nisibis and settled in Edessa, where Saint Ephraim took the leadership of the school of Edessa, which was founded in the second century AD. I think I should not continue. I took the 10 minutes. I'll finalize it next week, or I don't know whether it's going to be next week or the week after. I can't promise you. But the conclusion is interesting. Why it's interesting, the conclusion? We will deal with the word Theotokos, whether the Assyrian church will accept or does accept the word Theotokos. Is it wrong for the Assyrians when they hear Theotokos, they say, oh, this is heresy? Or is it not, not to be matter? It doesn't matter. We hear it. We accept it. What is the word Qnuma? Is Qnuma something important to be in this whole thing, in this whole mess? Then I will go into the agreement between the Catholic Church and the Assyrian Church of the East as basis, as a foundation for an agreement between the Assyrian Church and the Coptic Church. I think it is the way that we can sit as two brothers, as two sister churches, and say, listen, here's your teachings, here's our teachings. What do you see wrong in this? And we will tell you what we see wrong there. And they will be surprised that we will say, we don't see anything wrong. It's just misunderstanding. It's language barrier. We speak Aramaic, you speak Greek. And now you're actually speaking Arabic, which is, makes it more difficult. And you will see that we can find a common ground. The things or the issues that separate us are much, much, much less than the issues that unite us, the two churches, the one nature and the two nature. Uh, groups. And then what I will do, I will, at the end, I will try to give you my own personal thoughts about all this. And I have to be truthful and honest in what I will say to you next time. I think both groups made a mistake, big mistake. But that should not be the way today. Christianity is facing so many obstacles, so many challenges. We should not spend our times on fighting on, the the on Christological issues. We need to be united in face of these challenges. I will give you my, my own personal thoughts about this and how I see it and what is the, the way I see for the two churches or the two groups how to be united. And one final thing I say, it is wrong that when you negotiate peace, you put preconditions. It happened. That when we meet, there's preconditions. Oh, we want you to do one, two, three, four, five. Other, other than that, we will never sit with you. That's not a way in settling issues. Even governments, even politicians don't do that. So how would churches do this? I will never meet with you unless you meet my demands of one, two, three, four, five. Which I will tell you what are the demands when we met, when we tried to meet with the Coptic Church. Thank you very much. God bless you.